Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Environmental Social Justice. I am your host, Wendy Nystrom. I am here today with Joy Langford and Joel Vendette, my co-hosts. And we had Dave Johnson online, and the second we went live, we lost him. So I'm hoping he'll be back. He'll be back. He probably just hit the wrong button. But you know, the second I'm like, let's go live, he said, okay, and boom. <laughs> It's just, it's just because of how intimidating we are. That's all. We are so intimidating. Hi, Dave. Welcome back. I'm sorry. I, might, I gave you a fright. My my browser just closed. I don't know. It may be the, the, the time of the season. We had an earthquake yesterday, and now browsers are closing with their own mind. So who knows? I think, you know, if you want to make an entrance, that's perfectly acceptable. We're not going to yeah. judge you for that. <laughs> and we love having you on, Dave, because... You are, I mean, other than you're brilliant, you're a lawyer, you're, you're a Stanford professor, but one of the things you and I discuss, I know, because the accolades, one of the things you and I discuss, and I got to read the whole thing here, is can environmental and sustainability progress, progress only occur in a stable nation? Short answer, yes. But we have, yes. a, we have a mountain to climb with our political corruption going on right now. Yeah, I, I think the answer is, you know, in classic D, D school lingo, yes, and I'm almost inclined to say yes, but, which cuts against the grain, but yes, uh, we can make progress uh, even without a stable environment, uh, political environment, but it's going to be a lot, a lot, lot harder. And uh, there are going to be some countries that do not have stable uh, government corporate environments that can't make the progress, some who can make the progress in a state of instability. Uh, and honestly, right now, I think the U.S. is one of them. It, it's to me quite amazing that President Biden was able to get through any kind of climate legislation in the environment that we have now. Whether or not it turns out to be effective is another story. Honestly, I haven't read the bill through and through, so I don't know its its contours. But uh, my view is that the the best path forward globally is for the nations that have stable corporate and governmental environments to lead the way, and those of us who don't have stable environments to get them stable quickly, so that we yeah. can then join and add our voice uh, and action uh, to the effort. Okay, so now I have to ask, what nation do you think has a stable government right now? Canada. <laughs> well, touche. Canada is my go-to answer. Canada and 14 are my go-to answer for all questions that I don't know the answer to. So, <clears throat> yeah, there's. I, I'd even dare say that the UK that uh, is, is fairly stable. Uh, personally, uh, I think Scotland will ultimately... Uh, break away from the UK uh, and and be independent, but I, I think their government is still fairly stable. Um, gosh, you know, to be honest, Ukraine is fairly stable when you because they have a single cause at work. Uh, we are not, and and you know, since most of our audience here, I guess, is is American. Uh, and we know, I I at least know most about the corruption that's going on in the U.S. You know, you just look at all, th you just go, go to the fundamentals and look at the three articles of our Constitution. Article one establishes Congress. Article two establishes the executive. Article three establishes the courts. We have a court that is borderline, uh, if not wholly uh, illegitimate. Hmm. Um, we have, a, a, and that's the Supreme Court. The other, the, the trial courts are hanging on by their teeth, depending on which judge you're, you're looking at. Um, the executive has just gone through the, the worst period of corruption and tumult in the history of the country, period. And we can go into that or not, as the case may be. And I'll probably get some MAGA hate mail. I don't care. Um, now, when well, I do care. I have to spend more time deleting it. Uh, and Congress is uh, co-opted. The you know the two-party system is co-opted by one party being incapable of moving forward or incapable of having policies, incapable of of uh, governing with uh, rationality as opposed to panic and power grabs. And so Congress is is crippled. Um, 
norms have been shattered across the country. There's we have a two tiered legal system. Obviously, now we always had a two tiered legal system, if not a three tiered legal system. One for the rich and wealthy who can afford, uh, you know, really top notch lawyers and can afford to litigate and grind the government or their opponents to the ground, uh, and even if they're guilty. The second tier is one for everyone else except for people of color, and then people of color have the third tier system where, you know, if you're if you get pulled over and you're lucky enough to survive a police stop, then you know you're sort of on your own uh, when you get put into the system, uh, and it's just wrong at every level. It's just wrong, and it cripples the country writ large. It's it it. it it prevents us from having stability that's necessary, as we said at the top, to make progress. And I want to separate progress from the political uh, adjective of progressive. Um, I don't know if I'm a progressive or not. I might be. I don't really label myself. But making progress is something that conservatives should want to do as much as independents, as much as libertarians, as much as Democrats, as much as uh, progressives. Uh, and we, we're just not doing it. We're across the board. So where are we with the, 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 the climate change portion of that? Uh, we've had a lot of events in the last few weeks here in California, whether it was the energy grid, uh, water, as well as uh, fires. And it seems like when we put one fire out, so to say, uh, yeah. people kind of just forget about it. And we've got so many infrastructure uh, situations coming up uh, here in the state of California. Is it? Do you feel that people just don't know, or they're just leaving one fire, jumping out of one fire, you know, into another one? Or where where are we? Where's our psyche when it comes to all of these climate change issues? Uh when I started looking at climate issues as a student, uh, I'm going to hate to say this, 30 years ago, there are two things among many things, two things that really stood out that I learned straight away. One was um, that human beings, as a matter of their coding, as a matter of DNA, react to the acute event in their environment, and they do not react to the chronic event in their environment. This is from a book by Norman, I think it was Ornstein and Paul Ehrlich, that biologically we are we 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 evolved to react to an acute danger, but the chronic danger, you know, I, I hate to use the phrase, but it's common enough, the frog in the in the pan of water, we don't react to quickly enough. And climate change presents us with that problem. And that, that natural human reaction is something we're gonna have to overcome with our intelligence and reason, because we're gonna have to cut against our lizard brain on this one. Secondly, uh, we talked at length back in the day <laughs> about the difference between uh, mitigation and adaptation to climate change. And as the curve steadily progressed, showing us annual increases in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, year after year after year, the, the opportunities to meaningfully mitigate shifted, uh, shrank, and our energies necessarily shifted over to adaptation. So we are now in a land where we have to do mitigation, but that mitigation isn't we're going not we're not going to see the impact of mitigation that we do tomorrow for 20 years plus yeah very true what we can do and what we're going to see is action with respect to adaptation if we can get our blank together and actually get it done and i'm hopeful that biden's uh and the democrats bill on climate uh that just came down a couple of weeks ago is moving in the direction, certainly putting a lot of money in the direction of helping with adaptation. So we have all of these things going on. You know, I'm out here in California and, and we have the mosquito fire, which is the, the current one, um, you know, 1%, 2% contained, who knows? It depends on weather, uh, W-E-A, weather, 
uh, as to whether or not that fire really turns into a conflagration that takes out a, a one or two towns like the big ones usually do. Um, but the problem is when you look at adaptation, you fall back into the, the trap of where people won't react if it's not acute enough to them personally. Yeah. One so of the people in Wyoming see Californians having a fire and think, oh, well, God, I'm glad we're not having fires in Wyoming. They probably are, but not to the extent in California. Until it happens in our literal backyard, we as humans tend not to pay enough attention to it. And that's a real problem we have to overcome. No, absolutely. Um, just planning adaptation and resilience. But going back to when you talked about the um, inflation bill that was passed, the climate bill, hmm. I, I know I have a lot of friends all over the world and the feedback I've gotten, I've gotten two very important points. One was a lot of that money is going to the usual suspects. So a lot of these startups who have great new initiatives, great new inventions, great new ideas are not seeing any of that. It's just going to the same people that money's always been given to. And they don't feel that that's fair. And then we saw the stock market crash yesterday. So a lot of the finance people I know say, see, didn't work, it was complete crap. It actually is gonna put us further in the hole. What's your take on that? I mean, as a professional. Let me speak to the second one first, and then sure. I'll go I'll go to the first one. Today's, the, the, the market crash was tightly related to the extraordinary consumer price index number that came out in roughly around 8%. That was what the, the market reacted to that. Well, guess what number came out today? The producer's price index. The, producer's pr the consumer price index went up quite a bit. Okay. There's no sugarcoating that. The producer's price index went down. Cost to producers went down at the same time cost to consumers went up. The equation tells us that it, that's not the economy, that's corporate opportunism taking advantage of the ability to raise prices on consumers, even though they are not being forced to raise prices to maintain their margins. That's that is what, what's happening at the moment. We're still gonna see an increase of at least 75 basis points. There's even chatter about one full basis point, I don't know, come the next Fed meeting, which I think is in a couple of weeks. And, you know, yeah, we have to do that. But there's something more structural going on than this. What I think, what I feel is a fairly temporary inflationary bubble. And it has nothing to do with the bill being passed three weeks ago that has not even begun to become effective. Okay. That inflation is not related to the passage and the signing of a bill that has a lag time of at least a year or more before that money ever gets into the economy. That's a canard. So part one, I understand people want to correlate things, but you have to think about the lag time when things actually become effective. In the same way, we have to attend to the lag time of carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases going into the air and, and how long they're there before they have their, their uh, heat uh, or climate impact. This one frustrates me, you can tell. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I mean, I am not an economist. I, I'm a risk person, geologist. So when people make those statements to me, I can't really comment back because I simply don't know, which is why I want the public and everyone watching to understand that these knee-jerk reactions may not be entirely accurate. Um, but also, if we can talk about the money going to the same corporations over and over and over again, yeah. we might just be getting the same results over and over and over again. Yeah, I I don't know enough to speak, you know, with real intelligence to that because I haven't looked closely enough to see. But I'll take let's just take this as a hypo that a lot of the money is going to the same old same old players, and certainly some of it's going is necessarily going to. So the question then is, if there's a big pile of money going to, let's say, the oil and gas industry, are there constraints on how they use that money with respect to uh, more carbon capture, other kind of climate uh, mitigation or even adaptation uh, uh, issues or solutions? I would hope the answer is yes. It's in their interest, actually, to use that government money 
to improve their carbon uh, outputs. It really is. I mean, yeah. the oil and gas industry is going to face more and more competition every year from alternative fuels. They know that, and their 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 business strategy needs to be uh, to, needs to accommodate for, if not get them into the sustainable alternative fuels business. Yeah. Uh, so whether there's constraints on that money is my first question. And then the second question is, will they actually abide those constraints? And the third question is, can the government enforce those constraints if they don't abide by them? I ask those questions. I have no answer for them because I just don't know enough yet. And we haven't seen it in action yet. Yeah. And we can only hope that they would actually enforce anyone who's not using the money appropriately. Um one of the things Speaking of Brett Favre. <laughs> <Fourth one>? um, <laughs> I stole that from Joel. Um, in the write up, you had mentioned um, dark money. Mm. Could you explain what that is? Well, for me, I think a few people have different definitions. For me, dark money is uh, any significant money flowing into politics that is intentionally uh, hiding its original source. So, uh, you know, we have the uh, Citizens United case in the Supreme Court, thank you very little, John Roberts, that allows corporate money to set up these PACs that are supposedly unaffiliated with uh, a particular politician, but are issue PACs. And they can spend unlimited money talking about political issues because it's a matter of free speech. I understand the theory behind it, but the practical effect is that we have billions of, of dollars coming from places that we don't know that are quote unquote speaking to issues, but in fact supporting particular uh, parties and or their candidates. And it's a problem that we're not gonna get away with until we can limit the amount of money in politics. Uh, if not, as I saw somebody tweet just today, uh, the uh, aspirational uh, approach of going to pure public funded elections. So for me, dark money is money that we can't, we, the public, and perhaps even Congress uh, or the courts cannot actually identify the source. You know, it, it's transparent in the public eye now, but even the Saudi Arabia $2 billion to Jared Kushner for a, quote, investment fund uh, to an individual who has never run an investment fund in his entire life. Um, a little circumcised. To me, is might fall into the category of dark money. We may know the source, but we don't know where that money's actually going because I at least can tell you that I don't trust the people who are handling that money. Yeah. And so that to me also qualifies as dark money because we don't know into which political coffers some of that money is going to land. Yeah, so you're talking about PAC money, i.e. money, money that's, you know, accumulated, but we don't know exactly where the sources have come from and what the uh, objective uh, of the group that's raising the money uh, is within our political cycle. A lot has changed over, you know, the last few decades about how money is raised and uh, what money can be used for, legal fees. Uh, if you're convicted of a, uh, you know, of, of a crime, you know, you can now raise money for your legal fees. Like GoFundMe is is much more uh, elementary than some of the stuff that's going on in politics right now. Yeah. And I think I, I'm actually on that score can, encouraged that Steve Bannon is getting prosecuted by New York State for abuse of that fundraising mechanism that was so clearly a grift was a scam. Um, and that's a good step in the right direction. You know, we talk about dark money. We didn't even talk about foreign money. One of the things that's incredibly frustrating, of course, is we actually have laws on the books that say no federal money or in-kind support can illegally be accepted by any political party or politician in an American election. And yet, I firmly believe, and I will say allegedly, foreign dollars, foreign money came pouring into at least one of the campaigns in the 2016 presidential election. Um, there, there's a lot of evidence and there's a lot of smoke around that 
uh, issue and where the money came from is, of course, very dark. Uh, the country Malta comes to mind, among others, where money can be hidden, transferred, cleansed, and, and repurposed. Uh, you know, I practiced law for my first eight years in Miami, Florida in the 1980s. And although I didn't work in the world, I certainly learned enough about laundering money to know how it's done. And it just isn't that difficult. Um, and I think a lot of this political money is laundered. I had no clue. I guess yeah. I just think the best of people and that just makes me naive. Um, I mean, all you have to do is turn on the TV and I mean, you're inundated with ads for props for and against. And it's so funny because like you always watch them once I know I do. And I wait to see who sponsored it, this yeah. ad. Right. That's where I just start cracking up because I mean, we've got the one right now on gambling, on online gambling yes. that's hitting really hard yes. in California. And then it's like, yeah. you know, and it's like, this ad is, and I'm just going to make this up, like this ad is brought to you by the people who support online gambling, but it's not paid for by anything foreign or anything bad. We're really good people. I mean, it's like, that's like the name of the packs that are coming out or they're so vague that it's very misleading for people and it's really dangerous. And then when you actually go to vote and you try to do your due diligence and your research, these bills are so confusing for people as well, the way that they're written. So you're like, am I voting yes or no? It's... it's or people who aren't researching that just yeah. do any money mode. Yeah. 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 That's yeah. sad that's that really, happens, but it does. <laughs> that's a really good example because, because I'm seeing those same ads. It's Prop 27 and Prop 26 side by side. Prop 27 is a yes no vote basically on permitting uh, big corporate online gambling to come into California. Yeah. Uh, and there are opponents to Prop 27, um, and there are proponents. And you look at the proponents of Prop 27 and clear, and, and what they do, it's, it's you see DraftKings uh, on, the, on the list of supporters, but it's citizens in favor of supporting funding of uh, do, getting yeah. rid of homelessness, AKA DraftKings. And, and yeah, that and, you could you could even make the argument that that's a dark money play. They are trying to hide the source of the money that is throwing these you know tens or hundreds of millions of dollars worth of ads up on the TV to vote yes on Prop Twenty Seven, um, it's, but it's actually the corporate sponsors of yeah. the proposition. And it's happening in every single state, whether no matter what the main issue is in that state, it's citizens for X. Yeah. And it's like, you've got to research these things because like whether it's like an education thing or it's a healthcare thing or something like that, it's citizens for nurses, it's citizens for educators, it's whatever it is. So it sounds really good. It does. And then you got to think about, well, wait, hold up, wait, what? You know, so then I start, then you got to start wait, waiting for, so wait a minute, are the nurses actually sponsoring this thing? And so you right. have to look at, you know, are, you know, are the education groups, you know, are, are the, you know, the teachers unions, whatever, are they behind these things? Are they the ones that you, those are the ones that you really got to look for, not the ones that say citizens for. So I think that's where yeah. it gets very confusing for people. Yeah, I'll just put it, to put a bow on it, I think this is a really good example of another way that corruption has, has wound its way, has insinuated its way into our daily lives, into civil society, fracturing norms, corruption fractures norms. Uh, Wendy, back to your further comment, you're not naive. You just remember when we had better norms in our world. Yeah. And there was there's one individual uh, who unfortunately was handed a great deal more power than he was capable of managing, who has done a very good job over the last five, 10 years of fracturing norms in our country. And his name is Donald J. Trump. So when it comes down to fracturing the norms do and maybe this is me being overly pessimistic is this really something that has not been there or is it just something that we're now exposing and realizing this has been going on for decades or a lot longer than we realize mm. a little of both you know norms hold when uh, when and only when people uh impliedly agree to abide by them mm -hmm. you know one of the one of the basic norm examples we use in class sometimes is everybody understands that you drive on the right side of the road or the left side of the road 
you know, whichever country you're in, everybody abides by that. And we abide by the signs at the intersection or the rules if there are no signs at an intersection. Those are basically norms. They are laws, but they're also social norms that we abide by. And the reason we abide by them is because it's in each individual self-interest to abide by them so we don't get hit. And then you end up with this common good, a norm that everybody, almost everybody abides. Um, so we've had norms and they've been stable uh, for a long, long time in our country. Some of them have gotten better. Some of them have been degraded. But there has never, at least in my uh, 50 plus years of life, I've not seen uh, the wholesale effort to destroy norms as I've seen in the last 15 or 15 or so years uh, in, in a variety of ways. Do you think that the corruption, the corruption, I think has been going on and we're just, and we're now seeing evidence, more and more evidence of it. We're seeing more evidence of it. You know, a really good example there, uh, good example, bad facts, um, is the proliferation of video, uh, cameras on phones so that we now can catch police, uh, doing things that they've always been doing, but we didn't know were happening. Um, and so, you know, George Floyd being the probably the most obvious example, but hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of cases where cops lie about something and then the video proves that they actually committed uh, a felony or worse uh, in the process of making a stop or an arrest. Now, I guess circling back to kind of like what we were talking about at the beginning, which is kind of creating the norms going forward for environmental issues. I mean, we live in California. We get it. Everybody who's watching knows we're in California. Not everybody loves California. Got it. Check. Let's move on from that fact. However, I want to talk about, so kind of when you talk about how things can change to become a new norm, to mitigate a problem and not just react to it. We had California take the charge on what it was going to be for autom automobile the miles per gallon that was going to be required. And there was a whole big thing against the administration, EPA, and what the state of California did. And finally, California just said, bleep it, we're doing what we want. We then saw autom autom automobile manufacturers come in line and say, okay, got it. You're the sixth largest economy in the world. We can't mess with that. So, but then you started seeing it snowball into other states and other manufacturers, and these policies got adopted. Do you think this is the way that we start mitigating things as opposed to looking at our federal government mm -hmm. to say, we're fixing it, which I think too many people try to do. Do we need to do this on a state local level and then let those let those webs kind of go out and spread? I like that idea a lot. And I like that example even more. Uh, one of the things I love about California um, is that it has the power in the marketplace to cause change in the marketplace, irrespective of what the federal government might or might not want to do. And uh, I remember, still remember the day I heard that Gavin Newsom, this is probably 10 years ago now, that Gavin Newsom had uh, legalized gay marriage in California way before the federal government ever got around to it. I think this was even before Obama was president, I'm not sure, but even Obama, uh, bless his heart, was opposed at first to legalizing uh, gay marriage. And uh, the example with the automobile manufacturers is a perfect example. The automobile manufacturers realize that so many cars that they make are sold in California, that a California law requiring, uh, <laughs> requiring improvements to vehicles necessarily forced them with, by market force to make the changes it was in, it was the market forces that made them make the changes. So, yeah, I, I like the idea of what California is doing in that regard. Um, I'd like to see California and New York and Illinois and uh, all the major populous states aggregate into a coalition of sorts. I don't know if we could ever get Texas on board, who knows, or Florida on board right now, but at least major uh, population centers uh, actually start working together to create a coalition to do some of these things that the federal government is too lame, crippled, or corrupted to accomplish. One thing that I think is going to be really promising going forward is in response to the Inflation Reduction Act is we are, you know, there was the automobile tax credit, which really 
looks horrific on paper because there's not very many cars that are falling within the parameters of that. What we're seeing now as a result of it is all these automobile manufacturers are now saying, oh, wait a minute, if we want to go forward, we now have to build in America. We have to build in either Mexico, North America, or Canada. So you're starting to see these jobs potentially coming back. Obviously, that's not being discussed, but that's another set of issues. But, you know, so the long-term repercussions of the positive impact of this is massive, whether you're talking about the employment for construction jobs, you're talking about bringing down the prices of electric vehicles in time. It is going to take time. People need yep. to just blow their roll on this. But I mean, right. the long-term, you know, plus the unions, whether you're for them or against them, the unions are going to have to be there to, in order for these manufacturers to get the tax credit. So it's like the long-term repercussions, which again, we don't focus on. That's just our, our attention spans are too much like this. But to see the results of this act, which isn't even fully implemented, like you said, it's going to take at least a year we're already seeing that happen in just this one industry. At least the talk of it is happening and it's happening fast. Mm. That's huge for people. And it's not being covered so people can see where, you know, they want to see that, that our prices are coming down. We have money in our wallets, but it's like, in order for that to happen, these things have to happen as well. And I think like that's the part that's not being addressed. Yeah. You know, that's a really good example of, of the, the lag time, the, maybe maybe the benefit of the lag time. Uh, you know, there's a saying in, in business that uh, looking forward, you want to, you know, the ice hockey analogy, you, you want to skate to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. And that's that's what's going on here. The, the, the car manufacturers realize it takes years to retool, to design and then retool and then test and get approved a new vehicle, yeah. even a, a new ICE vehicle, much less than an electric. And so when they see the law come down and it has requirements 10 years out, they have to start now. They have yeah. to start yesterday. You know, the old saying of when, when's the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. What's the next best time is today. And that's what they're doing. And those are market forces at play. Market yeah. forces are incredibly power, powerful. And if we can figure out a way to design law like this, Joel, uh, design law that leverages market power, mm -hmm. uh, market uh, uh, influences in the corporate suite, uh, a lot of change can be made to happen. Yeah, there's a lot of change there. can be made to happen. We have to, we have to kind of... It's counterintuitive to want to work with the enemy, <laughs> so to speak, but that may be what we have to do. Well, it's funny because I think there's one manufacturer that was already planning to build a factory for electric vehicles here in the States, but they were about, they, they were going to be like two or three years out before they really got started on it. And and again, don't quote me on all these timeframes, but I believe what I saw was like, oh no, they went, oh, hold up. We no longer get the tax credit for our vehicles which is going to really impact our sales. So we are now going to try to get this done a year. We're actually going to start planning everything a year earlier to try to be mm -hmm. up and running even faster. So I think this is the stuff people, we want the immediate response. We want it now. When you're talking about anything federal, good luck. I mean, we all know nothing happens fast on the federal level, on the government level. It just don't. So, but to see these things already happening within a few weeks or months, that's huge and i don't yeah. it just it kills that's me it's not being, it. but it's not being discussed and that's the part that i don't like is that we're not sitting there breaking the news down of like okay the bill isn't even fully in effect but already we've got a through acd or abc whatever you want to say starting why are why are people campaigning on these things i don't understand we're not talking about it and, and letting people know i genuinely can't wrap my head around it <sighs> Exactly. Yeah, we get to a place where <laughs> we're, let's let's tilt towards mainstream media here for a second because corporate media uh, sort of decides what what we see and hear, right? It's not a um, story. And and if it's not a story, you know the old saying in local news: if if it bleeds, it leads. There's right. just again the acute as opposed to the chronic is what human beings pay attention to, and that applies to you know, what sort of news people consume. And it's exacerbated by social media where where clicks are money. And, and and so we're all, you know, we all suffer the the sexy headline in a tweet or on Facebook and then read the story and find out the headline doesn't really represent the story, but we clicked and they made their money. Um, 
<laughs> you know, so we have to be really careful consumers. And I would say, I, I wanted to make sure I said this to your audience. Is that we have an election coming up, a really, really, really important election coming up in a couple of months. And what's going to happen has already started, as Joel pointed out. But what's going to happen increasingly intensely starting now through November Election Day is we're going to get more and more bombarded with more bad information, misinformation, lies that are going to try to influence us to vote in the direction that somebody else wants us to vote, not the way we might want to vote. So we have to really heighten our awareness and we really have to pay close attention to what's being thrown at us on television, on, on social media, et cetera, uh, and, and dig a little bit harder, dig a little bit deeper. Or if you don't want to do the digging, ask somebody you know and trust to give you an objective sense of what what a certain issue is and what a, a particular politician or law does or does not stand for. Do we and even then have a neutral media source anymore? That. Sorry? Do we even have a neutral media source anymore? I'm not sure because uh, public uh, NPR seems to have slipped a little bit. Yeah. I feel like one of the most level-headed ones out there right now might be Axios because if you go to their articles, it is literally like headline, verb, here's why this matters, detail, detail, detail. And it's all bullet points. It's not fluff text. It's not trying to just do word count on a page. It's literally mm -hmm. just bullet, bullet, bullet. This is why it matters. This is what you should care about. Move on to the next thing. So I actually think that they mm -hmm. have a good news source personally, but that's just my opinion. Yeah, I, I don't want opinions. I just want fact. Yeah. You know, I'll make a plug here that I, I learned inadvertently by living overseas for the uh, couple of years, last couple of years, that uh, for world news, French, fr uh, French television news, France 24, you can find it on cable sometimes, France 24, of all of the national news broadcasts, and I saw 10 or 15 different nations worth, France 24 struck me, English version, struck me as the one that handled the global news better than anyone else. They sort of have replaced BBC as sort of the premier, in my mind, the premier objective thorough and and uh, in interviews quite pointed deliverer of uh, objective national news for what it's worth I hope you can find it on your cable it's worth a look yeah it's good to know because I, I watch a lot of BBC myself so it's good there's an alternative um, we have gone into about 40 minutes <laughs> but, <laughs> I know I mean I'm just like yeah we'll be about 15 20 minutes no this is fascinating and so important for people to know about um just obscene corruption is out there and before we leave dave do you have any advice on how to address the corruption or at least let people know about it well the first thing i think is to and, and you know corruption is such a broad term uh it comes at us in so many different ways and a lot of it we can't see and as individuals if we can't see it we can't do anything about it but uh Big picture, number one, uh, vote ethics. Thank you uh, for saying that. <laughs> and, and then number two, uh, kind of on the heels of what I just said, is pay more and more attention to the possibility of artificial intelligence, deep fakes, and photographic disinformation yeah. as well as print disinformation. Because of social media, pictures are much more uh, important. And it's too easy. You see it every day on Twitter, people getting fooled by somebody who photoshopped or worse, uh, uh, did a deep fake on something and uh, intentionally released it without disclosing it as such. Usually it gets caught. But be careful about what information we consume and take to heart uh, before you authenticate it. Sage advice. Very sage advice. So, Dave, thank you so much for your time. As always, you're welcome back anytime that you want to come. Your insight is very valuable to not only us, but everyone who listens. 
So on that, guys, I will say thank you. I'm Wendy Nystrom with Environmental Social Justice with my guests, Joy Langford and Joel Vendetta. Sorry, co-hosts. Shoot. Co-host Joy Langford and Joel. I know Joel, just giving me the eyes. And thank you to our guest, Dave Johnson. We will have you back as many times as you want to come. We love having you. Thanks, Take care, thank guys. you very much. I appreciate that. Take care. Take guys. care. Bye now.